on this cold Sunday morning, and um, I'm going to introduce Peter to you. We're going to be talking about sin consciousness today. It's going to be amazing, so if you just uh, give a big welcome to Peter Swart. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this thing is going to be in my face. So. Can I move this yet, Cynthia? Is it okay? Amen. Amen. The pastor showed up. Can you believe that? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Where's my glasses? I got new glasses. Can you believe that? And uh, just for in case. So this morning, I want to welcome you all. Um, I'm excited about talking about this because um, this is really going to help you. And I'm like, a... thank you, brother. Um, I am. Uh, Really excited about this because this can help a lot. And this is what the Father is really speaking with me. We may say this is foundation teachings. Yes, it is. Um, but the Father is really want to, I think you want to impress something on our hearts this morning, on your heart. And um, this is actually where I am now. So when we talk about sin consciousness, I'm going to explain that to you. Um, it's actually what sin conscious is. If you look in the book of Hebrews, we're going to go into Hebrews, you will discover that it is actually the opposite of perfection. And I'm going to prove it, and I'm going to show it to you. And then we're going to frame your age that you are living in. You're going to put it in order. Amen. So let's start right in the beginning in Genesis. And if we, if we begin out in De Genesis, it's important that we start there. Uh, in Genesis 1, we see that God created, we, we see that he created everything that he wanted to create, and then he said, it is good. And the Bible said, and God, and God saw that it was good, okay? But when God created man, the scriptures say, in Genesis 1, the scriptures say, and God say, it was very good. Everything that he created, he say it's good. But when he created us, he say it is very good. Amen. And that's how the Father saw us. So Adam and Eve lived in perfection. They live without the sin conscience. They live in the rest of the Father. What I mean by rest is that we know that the Father created, and then after the sixth day, he rested. Now, God was not exhausted. Many of the people think that God was exhausted. No, what God did when he rest is that he celebrate perfection. That's what rest is. Rest means to celebrate perfection. Amen. And today I want to say to you that you, you may look at yourself and see yourself through one dimension. But it's time for us to see ourselves through the dimension that God sees us. And God is celebrating over you every day because he is celebrating perfection. God made no junk. You agree with me on that? Amen. So we know, we know what happened with Adam and Eve. Um, that they ate from the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And I just want to throw in the word evil here before we go on and explain to you how I see that tree. Many people see this tree different. It's fine. They, they say that the, the, the law was birthed out of it, which is true. It's a representation of the law. You got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you got the tree of life. Okay. And God warned them. He said, don't eat from that tree. And they were deceived into it, and they ate from that tree. Now, the word evil in the new covenant is explained very clearly, and the word evil means poneros, if you study it in the Greek. And the word poneros means toiling, hardships, annoyances. That's what the word evil means. You can go and check it up. There's two words in the Greek for, um, there's two words in the Greek for evil. The one is kakos, which means it's just bad. You're a bad person. But the word that is, is used 
in, in, in um, um, uh, that is used most of the time in the New Covenant is poneros, which means evil. So if the Bible says that we have an evil heart of unbelief, then it means your heart is established in annoyances. It's established in works. It's, it's established in labors. I'm, my heart is programmed to do, so that, so to, to try to get God to bless me. And your heart is not designed for that. Your heart is designed to rest in the grace of God. Okay. I'm not going to go into that today. But when I look at that tree that they ate, that they ate from, then, then I call it because the tree was a tree of evil, which is works, labors, and it was a tree of good, which shows the good. Okay? Um, I see it as the tree of mixture. Um, I believe that the big problem today in the body of Christ is mixture. It's the mixing of works and rest. It's the mixing of grace and law. This is, this is, that's how I see that tree. I see that tree as the tree of mixture because it, was, it shows them both. So they see the good and they're going to try to live up to the good by their own ability. And that's not how God has created man. Okay, so they fall out of it. I just want to lay this as a foundation here this morning. So... And uh, um, if, if we go further in here, and if, if you understand it is mixture, so the deception was that they eat from the tree that say to them, you will become, but they were already created. Okay, I, that's very important that you get that this morning in your mind. That was the deception. If you eat from this tree, you, your eyes will open and you will become. And that's where things fall apart from that moment on. And it was, uh, uh, to them it was a desire to eat from because they think, okay, we will become like God. But the deception was they were already created in the image of God. Amen. And today we see that same thing happening in the body of Christ. I'm not judging. I preach the same thing. Um, we see the same thing happening that people preach grace they preach the, and then they would mix in some stuff okay you, you got to do this to get this all right and I will connect some conscience to that so if someone have to come and give you the original Mona Lisa you know what I'm talking about I'm talking about the Mona Lisa that's a painting that <laughs> I think is very expensive but if someone have to come and give you the original you will be so lucky I don't think we, any of us would be so lucky in this life but if you would be so lucky, someone come and give you the Mona Lisa, and you took that Mona Lisa, and you say, ah, no. I think I need to paint in some more little flowers and things here and so, that, so that I can make this thing that it looks better. What are you doing? You immediately took away from the value of that painting. Are, are you with me? Because it was originally not created that way, Okay. And that's exactly what happened with sin conscience. I'm going to bring that in. Is that you think that my value is not good enough. I am not good enough. I got to add on to. It's Jesus plus something else. It is, it, I am created in the image of Jesus. But hey, hey, it's not enough. I got, I, got, I got to get more here. So that God can show up. Hey, God have already showed up. God have already showed up this morning. You show up with God. Moses was standing at the, at the Red Sea, and he tried to back up out of that relationship, and, and he was in, in a place that the Philistines were coming. How many of you have in a place that, that there's a deadline on the end of the month, and it's like, the, it's like uh, not Philistines, the Egyptians. The Egyptians is coming, and you see them coming, and you got a deadline. It's like, oh, my God, I'm not. And you know what? It wasn't Moses that was standing there. It was God who stood there. It was God and Moses together. And God says, stop complaining. Go on with the job. Stretch out your arm. Amen. He framed his age. We're going to look at that in a moment now. So what is powerful about this, it's not that you are. Many Christians see themselves as I'm a saved child of God. And I worship this glorious God. And God say, no, it is one. It's not you are a saved human being standing here and I'm the glorious God standing out there. God said, no, I've become one with you. Jesus made the most powerful.
powerful statement when he said to them in John 14, in that day, that's the day when the Holy Spirit came. How many of you remember that the Holy Spirit already came, that the Holy Spirit is here? He says, you will know that I am in the Father and the Father in me and I in you and you in me. That is the most profound statement that Jesus could ever make. And the church is still not getting it. I'm talking about myself. Right now, you are the giant. Right now, you are on top of the mountain. If you begin to see yourself through the dimension that God sees you, amen. Okay, you still with me here? <laughs> so let's look this morning, and I, and I wonder if I must read a verse here. I didn't even read the verse yet, but we will get to, to, um, to and I think it's important that I explain this. Um, the word sin, we talk about sin conscience this morning. The word sin is hamartia in the Greek. It exists of two words. Ha, which is a negative. Say negative. And, and martia is rooted in miros, which means form. So sin means negative form. That's what sin really means. Um, if we talk about transformation, then we say metamorphosis, and that word morphosis is also rooted in miros, and the word meta means with, so it means with form. So if I'm transformed, I am with God's form. Okay. If I'm living in sin, I am living in a negative form. That means I have a negative identity of myself. Sin is not really the things that you do wrong. So this, the things that we call sin is actually just an outflow because you have a negative form of yourself. So now you have a vacuum in you and you've got to fill it with something else. And now you, we are plucking on the fruits. What we are doing in, in most of the time over the years, I've done the same thing. I'm teaching the fruit on the tree. And I'm telling people all the things that they do wrong and they got to get themselves straightened out. But the root is I have a negative form of myself. Okay, you still with me? You're in this Episcopalian church this morning. How do you pronounce it? It's not what I do wrong. It's the, it's the result of a negative image of yourself. Okay, Paul called it the works of the flesh. I love to call it that way. Because you see yourself through a different dimension. You see yourself through the flesh. You see yourself only through one dimension which is the flesh. God wants you to see yourself through the dimension that he sees you through perfection. Amen. So if we go into the, 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 this passage that I want to um, uh, talk to you about this morning, is that um, um, if I have a sin conscience, then it means my, my, my subconscious, my heart believes is occupied with feelings of unworthiness. It's occupied with guilt. It's occupied with condemnation, rejection. It's areas that we need to be set free from. But the gospel got the power to set you free. Hallelujah. We're going to look at that too this morning. Amen. So if we go into Hebrews 4, if we want to understand what sin conscience mean, then we need to start off in Hebrews 4. Okay, can we do that this morning? From verse 7 to 10, he says... Again, he designated a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So what I believe, what, uh, what, what uh, 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 sin means, hamartia, uh, uh, hamiros, a negative form, I honestly believe this is the shape that your heart is in. Your spirit is complete in Christ Jesus. How many of you agree with me right now? If you're a believer in Jesus, you are, your spirit looks like Jesus. It's completely perfect. There's nothing wrong with your spirit. Amen. But if you have a wrong belief about yourself, then it means your heart is misformed. Your identity is misformed. You have a, a belief system about yourself that is interfering with who you are, okay? And it forms a vacuum. So let's go on here. Said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. The voice of God is very powerful. I tell you that right now. Amen. For if Joshua had been given rest, say rest. 
then he would not afterwards spoken of another day. So again, when we look at the rest, we talk about celebration of perfection. All right. The father, when he created and he saw that everything was very good, he rested, he celebrated his per the perfection of what he have created. All right. I just want to drive that in again. Then he would not sp spoke of, uh, uh, of another day. Therefore remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Hallelujah. Amen. Nobody and nothing is allowed to work on Sabbath day. Sabbath is not a one day event. Sabbath is since the day God rested. And the moment we rest in him, we enter the Sabbath. And we begin to live from out of perfection. Okay, you still with me? But Peter, we didn't find the word perfect in the Bible yet. Yeah, we will. Hold on. Okay, don't fall apart. Okay. <laughs> okay. The voice of God in your heart has the power to destroy a sin conscience. The gospel got the power to destroy a sin conscience. Take it out completely. I'm telling you, man. But we have to preach the pure gospel. And the voice echoes rest, which leads to perfection. Still with me? Okay, now. Hebrews 10, verse 1 to 3. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect, say perfect, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, for the worshippers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins or have no sin conscience anymore when they were perfected. Do you agree with me this morning? But unfortunately, Jesus, the Lamb of God, didn't show up yet. They did these sacrifices with points to Jesus that was coming, and they were doing this over and over and over, and they were reminded of their sins. Every day, every year, they were reminded that they fall short. They were reminded that they are not good enough. They were reminded that, 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 that they need a, a, a lamp. And, and the, the sacrifices only temporarily take away their sins. But the lamp of God who showed up, Jesus, took away the sin of the world once for all, forever. Okay? Now... Let's go on, and then we look at, in the same chapter, 10, verses 11 to 14. Now, every priest stands, say stand. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices would, which could never take away sins. Never. The Bible make it very clear. Never. All right? But this man, ooh, I love this man. <laughs> but this man, this man, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, set, say set. He sat down. The priests were standing. They were working. They were trying to fix this thing. He sat down. Oh, I love that. I love this. <laughs> At the right hand of God, from that time waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Come on. By one offering, in contrast to a sin conscience, if by one offering have perfected you, if he have completed everything in you, you're supposed to celebrate perfection with God every day instead of saying to God, okay, when are you going to come through for us? Okay, when are you going to... Wait, there's something missing in my heart, in my belief system, if I think so. So some people would struggle in the area of healing or some will struggle in the area of finances or some in relationships. It is like a misformed area in your belief system where the perfection of Jesus haven't flowed in yet. You didn't allow him. But your spirit is absolutely perfect, all right? 
So that's why we can't stop preaching this gospel. We have to preach on the good news over and over and over until we get it all, get it, and we all have it. It's actually supposed to be very simple. But we are living in a world where these things is bombarded at us all the time, and the worst is the pulpit. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking in general. You will be shocked go visiting certain churches. Me and Kathy visit the church. We were shocked when we walk out. And I was like, Lord, this is like, is this, can this be real? Okay, I'm not going there. So if we go back to Hebrews 4, then the question is, what is going on in the context of chapter 4 in Hebrews 4? We talk about, we talk about sin conscious, we talk about perfection. The rest of God is to celebrate perfection. Amen. The context um, uh, in, this, in this whole passage in chapter 4 is God, actually you can add chapter 3 to it, is God calling his people into rest. He's calling me and you to come into rest. He wants you to be there. This is where he wants you to live from. All right? Adam and Eve was created in perfection. They live in the rest of God. What they were living in fellowship of God and living in that garden, they live with an authority over things. Things just work for them. They didn't know that they have to work for something. That came afterwards when they ate from the, from the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. But, in, but before that, things were working for them. God was working for them. Everything was working and it was in harmony and everything worked out. When we enter into the rest of God, stuff begin to work in harmony for us. Because God is in the game. Okay? Now let's go on. In Hebrews 4, verse 11 to 12. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. And then he say, for the word of God. He used the word for there. What is that? What do you call that again? Without a preposition. Is it? The word for, that's a preposition. I'm right. So then it, then it means it's saying, it is saying like, because of this, this is why I'm saying for the word of God. Okay. Is loving and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and uh, spirit, joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word that he is referring to here is the gospel. Okay? It is Jesus. <laughs> it's the voice of God. The word that he is referring here to, how many of you agree with me that Jesus is the word? And the word got the power. Oh, excuse me, this thing jump again with me. I don't know why it does it. Press every time at the wrong place. The word got the power. The word got the power to cancel out what circumstances and the law is saying to you. It got the power to cancel it out. Absolutely. How many of you sometimes been in a situation and God gave you a word? Jesus personally gave you a word and you just know that you know that you know I've overcome this thing. I maybe don't see it in the natural, but I've already overcome this thing. All right. So, so um, if, 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 if we have to look in the context of chapter 4, the Bible say that they were disobedient and they didn't enter into the promised land. Okay, he's referring to those people. Why didn't they enter into the promised land? Because they made a mistake by sending out spies. <laughs> Two of them came back with a very good report. The other ten came back and this is what they say. And it's, and it's very interesting to me. He says, we saw the giants, the descendants of Anna came from the giants, okay? And we were like grasshoppers in their own sight, in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. See, this is what a sin conscience does. A sin conscience tells you you're small. A sin conscience tells you you didn't win. A sin conscience tells you this thing is too big for you. You're not going to make it. That's what a sin conscience say to you. 
We saw, we looked like grasshoppers. How many times we had circumstances and that thing looked so big and I looked so small? Can I tell you why? Because we look at it through one dimension and that is the flesh. But if you begin to look at that through the dimension that God is looking through it, and if you begin to see the way that God sees it, this is when we rise above things. Amen? Amen. So this is the way that they've seen it. They had a sin conscience. I'm smaller than my circumstances. This thing is, is, is I feel like a slave to this thing. This thing just don't want to go away. It's there all the time. Because I'm looking at that thing and it, is a, it has become a giant because I see that thing through belief system that is in me. I see that thing through a sin conscience which tells me I'm, I've not been perfected in this situation. I'm telling you right now, you are perfect as Jesus is perfect. And you stand above that situation the way that Jesus stands above it. I'm going to prove it as we go further on. How much time do I have? Um, what's the time now? I have no <laughs> Okay, let's go on in Hebrews 4, verse 14 and 15. He says, seeing then that we have a great high priest, thank you, Jesus, who passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Now, the question that I want to ask you here this morning is, can we look at the context again? Chapter 4, what is the context? The context is enter God's rest. The context is celebrate perfection. Is that what we are talking about? So if we look in the context of what was Jesus tempted? You know what? I think Jesus was tempted all the time. Hey, go back into your own strength. How many of you agree with me that the, that the law is compared to stones or to a stone? Remember Satan said to him, why don't you change these stones into bread? He was saying to Jesus, why don't you use the law as your nourishment? Have you ever seen that one? Ooh. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of my father. I'm nourished by what he say about me. I'm nourished by the power that he invests in me. I'm nourished by every word that my father says to me. I will never be nourished by the law again. I will not submit myself to the law where I work to get to a place that God will have to accept me. That will not be my nourishment. I will accept it as holy and perfect, but it cannot change me. All right? You still with me? Did I lose you here this morning? Huh? So that's what the context is. You remember, listen to what he say. Oh, I love this. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. Listen to what he say there. But I fear, Paul is talking to the Corinthians. He says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. How was she corrupted? How he used this illustration here. How can me and you be corrupted from the simplicity of the gospel? Can I tell you what's the simplicity of the gospel? The simplicity of the gospel is you have been perfected. You look like Jesus. The deception is no, you will become. That's what he said to Eve. That's how you get corrupted. This is how the church gets corrupted when we think we will become something. When we think it's somewhere in the future. It's like a carrot on a stick in front of us. And you are going and going. And it's like you can never reach that carrot. Man, you are full, wall to wall, full of God. Come on. Come on. The, temp the temptation is you are not complete. Colossians uh, 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 2, 9 and 10. The fullness of the God that dwells in him bodily. And you are complete in him. See the temptation is to say to you. No Peter you fall short. You're not going to make it. 
same old, same old. You grew up like that as a kid. It have never left you. You're going to be like this forever. This thing is going to rest over you for the rest of your life. You just can't overcome it. Liar, liar. It's not the truth. It's not me and the glorious God. No, the glorious God have taken residence in me and in you. This is the wonder of the gospel. They never saw this coming. Not the devils, not the demons. Nobody have seen this coming. Not even the, the religious leaders of his day. That God would come and live in a man and a woman. It's the greatest thing ever. Thank you for enthusiasm. You may sit down now. The simplicity of the gospel is you are as he is. So we are in this world. That's the simplicity of the gospel. There's nothing difficult about it. We want to make it difficult because of our human brains. Let's go on. Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore, <laughs> because Jesus has overcome the temptation, come on. We have a high priest who represents us on the throne, holy and perfect. Come on. Can anybody remove him from the throne? Nobody can. He's there forever. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace and let we, so that we may obtain mercy and grace and help in the time of need. Every time that you are tem tempted with this thing that I'm not good enough, I fall short, this is a giant that is, or, or that is tormenting me, this thing, you can come to the throne of grace and receive, say receive, mercy to overcome Thank you, Jesus. You know what's the amazing thing? The gospel is calling you to a place where you sat down. <laughs> okay, I have this situation. Where I'm, I'm not going to stand. I'm not going to work. I'm, I'm going to sit down. My father is going to talk to me. And I'm in this thing with him. Now, okay, let me just bring you to reality. We are almost done. I, I got some good stuff here that's coming, which this is what's blessing me, and I've laid a good foundation here. At this stage, you understand where you are in this whole game, okay? Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. I know this passage so good. Because he said there, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loves us. You know, you know there was a time in my life that, that I was in a group, and, and I don't even have to mention the name, Man, I was preaching faith, and I was preaching confession of the word. But you know what? I had a problem. I didn't believe God loves me. So my faith didn't work for me. Faith, the scriptures say faith working through love. The Greek word is energeo. Faith is energized by love. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I didn't know he loved me until I found out that he loved me. This is when faith began to work for me, because now I can trust. So he say here, because of the, his great love. It's not a small love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses. When you were in sin. When I was working in that correctional serv service. And I was a sinner and a bad person. And doing bad things. I should have been locked up myself. He loved me unconditionally. And he was sending everything and every person and make every way that I must come to the understanding that he loves me, that he wants to save me from those things. And he saves me from it. Amen. I was dead in my trespass. Made us alive together. <sighs> Say together. With Christ. And then he put in brackets by grace you are saved. You want to see the salvation of God? This is the salvation of God. He made you alive. He raised you up together. He made you sit together in heavenly places. That's the grace of God. See, in Hebrews 4, I believe there is a difference. In Hebrews 4 is when me and you have been overpowered by stuff. And he's talking to Hebrews here. You agree with me? He's talking to people under the law. The, we, the, the door is always open to come back into the grace of God. But I believe that God wants you to understand that you can always be on the throne. In all circumstances. Understand, hey, I'm standing on this earth, but the spirit that is in me is on the throne too. <laughs> I'm standing tall in this life. Amen? You still with me? Oh, man, here comes the good part. 
together in the heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, say ages, he might show exceeding riches in his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I am living and you are living in the age of grace. It's a time. Listen, I'm going to shock your religious mind a little bit here this morning, if you have a little bit of religion in you. God wants you to take advantage of him. He wants you to take advantage of his grace, of his love. When I woke up this morning, he says, when are you going to start taking advantage of me? I'm like, okay. I think we're going to preach a good sermon this day, me and you. See, that's the rest of God. We sat down with him. <laughs> People underestimate the power of the church. I believe in the gathering of the body of Christ. I see so many people out on Facebook and on social media that is hurting by the body of Christ. That is uh, things against the body of Christ. They're outspoken against it. You know what? They can be healed. They have just heard the wrong gospel. That's all. They just heard mixture. And now they come out and they are angry with everyone. I remember when I heard grace, I was so angry. <laughs> with all the previous preachers that preached to me. And then one day the Lord said to me, get over it and go on. Because you were there too. They don't know better. Just love on them. Are you with me? Okay, let's look at this age. <sighs> oh, let's look at the five euros because this is where we're going to start to close down here this morning. I love this. He say in Hebrews 11, verse 39 to verse 40, listen to what he say here. And all these, now you know, he talk about the five heroes in chapter 11. You agree with me? He talk about Enoch, and he talk about Noah, and he talk about Abraham, he talk about David, he talk about all these great men of, uh, uh, and women of God that were doing great things. And he say they had a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, say us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So I was looking at this and Lord, what are you really saying is going on here? He says, Peter, they were living in a age. I speak to them, they resp respond to that word, and they did something. I want to read to you what they did. Because this is where me and you come into the picture. Verse 1 to 3 says, Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds, now that word world there in the Greek is a one. If you check it in the Greek, it says that the ages were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by the things which are visible. Yes, what I want to say to you is, each one of those elders, each one of those people who had a good testimony, heard from God, and they framed their age. To frame an age means you put it in perfection. You means you put it in order. It means you set it free, your age that you are living in. How many of you agree with me? Noah heard to build, because when Noah was living, the age that he was living in was messed up. How many of you agree with me? God told him, build a boat. He built a boat. All the animals on there, and the whole thing was saved. And they framed their age. They start all new. God bring God's perfection back into it. But they did not not live the full promise and the full perfection that we have because the real the real gospel was preached through Jesus when he rose through the dead and Jesus came and established an age that we are living in now we got more than what they got and God want to use the church to frame this age that we are living in to put it in order, to bring it in perfection. And you know why is the reason that we struggle to do it? Because of a sin conscience. We're falling short. We're not good enough. What does other people think of me? Oh, I'm stressed so bad. What is wrong with my hair? We see ourselves all the time through one dimension. And God, well, I don't want you to live like a slop, okay, all right? 
but <laughs> you're still with me but God wants you to see you through the dimension that he sees you God wants you to see yourself and the body of Christ and every person around you that they are not just human beings they have been created in the image of Jesus Christ they have been perfected they have the power to together we can frame our age how many of you agree with me that I read to you that passage that he said that in the ages to come that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us. We are living in this age now. Man, if we can just get rid of this tree that people try to plant all the time in the body of Christ. There's one tree and there's the tree of life and we got nourishment from that tree. We live off that tree. Amen. Okay, we are almost done. Hebrews 1. I just want to prove to you <laughs> that, that, that we, are, we have a better age. Amen. He said, Yet God who at various times and at various ways spoke in time, time past to the fathers by the prophets. Can you see that? God spoke to them by the prophets. God gave them a word. God used the prophets. God gave Noah God, a personal word, Abraham a personal word. There was prophets right through the old covenant. God spoke through them and they framed their age. They did certain things. But they didn't frame it to the perfection that we can frame stuff. I, I, I believe that, that in, our, in our generation, I mean, I'm, me and Pastor Greg is hitting in the 60s. But I believe we're going to see some stuff happen, man. As the body of Christ is picking up this thing and start running with this. And they are the giants in the earth. Amen. Okay, let's read this. He say, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Oof. How many of you agree with me here this morning? The voice that we're hearing in our heart. The word that is powerful. He spoke to us not by just a little scripture. It's the son. The fullness of the word is dwelling in you. He's speaking to you through that. Okay, let's go on. Has in these lives, okay, whom he has appointed, now listen to this, he, whom he has appointed as heir of all things, say all things, through whom he also made the worlds, that word is a one in the Greek, and through him he made the ages, and we are living in this age now, oh Jesus, I love this. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things through the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We have been purged from our sins. You're not supposed to have a sin conscience. You've been perfected. God is celebrating perfection every day when he look at you. It's time that you begin to celebrate together. Are you guys with me? When they come and they tell you you are ugly, you say, Woo, Jesus, thank you. I know how I look in you. You are such a poor, miserable babe. I celebrate my perception in Jesus. Whew, Jesus. See, you are the temple of God. And there's no, when they built the temple, they were, they, they, they were not supposed, they were not allowed to use a hammer or anything in that temple that making sounds. They did everything in the quarry. They chop all the stone, uh, they, they, they cut all the stones in the quarry to perfection and bring it over and put the temple together. The quarry is where Jesus hang on the cross, <laughs> where he shout out it is finished, which is perfection. That the last time, where the word teleo come from, the end, it is finished. And we are the temple. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, but together we are also the temple of God. And we are all costly stones put together. And there's not supposed to be any sound of hard work and labor. Nothing. It's just being. Are you guys with me? Jesus. Jesus didn't do half a work. He did. He was successful in his work. He finished it. When he say it is finished, it is written, I think, in the present perfect tense. 
that is continually continuing into the future. We are living there. I want to see in my age that I am and that you are living in, that we frame it, that we bring it to perfection. And the only way that we can do that is say, Jesus, let this gospel be so loud and clear that I, have been, that I am set free, that there is no thought in me that I'm inferior, no thought in me that I'm condemned in any area, no thought in me that I am not good enough. It all vanishes. And we are like the early church, the, Steve, the Stevens, and, 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 and um, who was it? It was Stephen, and what was the other guy who went to Samaria? <laughs> Stephen was, was uh, stoned and Philip, <laughs> that we are like the Stevens and Philips who just go out and frame our age that we are living in. You lead one guy to Jesus like Philip, he ran to, the, to that Ethiopian man on the wagon, the chariot or whatever. <laughs> Baptize him. History shows that the huge revival was in Ethiopia. <laughs> History shows it. Let one man to God go and affect his whole, whole nation. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you this morning that we are not like this, the priests who stand because the sacrifices is going on and we still have to continuously do things to get rid of sin. No, by one offering, you have perfected us, Lord. And we thank you that we can celebrate this perfection and we can rest in you. Father, I pray that this message will go out into the body of Christ everywhere. Help us to preach it in perfection too by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and your grace so that the body of Christ can rise up and be glorious in the earth, glorifying your name. We thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, I love that. I love that it is, it is a finished work, and it's nothing that we have to gain. It's something we have to earn. It's just something that we have to embrace and unpack more and more by the Holy Spirit. And he's faithful. The Holy Spirit is faithful. How many of you guys have found that in your lives? Like he is just, he's unpacking it. And maybe you haven't, you have it all. Maybe you haven't discovered all that you have yet, but you're, you're further along than you were last week. You're further along than you were a year ago, amen? Praise God. And we are gonna see this. I'm excited about this, Peter. God is doing something, I'm telling you guys. I, I don't know. I know you're feeling it. God is doing something amazing in our time. Um, a few things I just want to encourage you and remind you about for those that maybe have uh, been sent this link. If you want to find out more about just kind of um, just the basics of grace, what are the basics of this new covenant that we have in Jesus Christ? You know, for uh, a lot of us, I think almost everyone I've talked to, this is something that has been um, greater, what Jesus has finished for us than what I grew up finding out about. I, I found out about part of it, but I didn't find out about all of it. And so um, all of us here at Healing Grace, we've been on a journey um, with Jesus, finding out the fullness of what his work has actually accomplished for us. So if you want to find out more about what that is and hear the other classes as well, uh, classes that Peter have done and others have done as well, um, I encourage you to go to Healing Grace Tulsa on YouTube, type that in the search bar, and at the very top of the feed, you're going to find all those classes. So you can go through that. It's like a, it's a whole course basically in what this new covenant is and what Jesus has accomplished for us. Um, pass that on to others. This is good news. This is good news free of all the religious ties and, and bindings, and it, it really sets you free to receive all that Christ has. Also, we want to make sure that everyone gets a copy of um, the 1 John 1, 9 um, scripture, understanding that. That's given by Bob George, and it's a free gift. Excuse me. Um, through the church. And so that's over there on the table as well. And it just answers the question, you know, have I been forgiven once and for all? When I do sin, is it important that I remember all my sins and confess them all to have fellowship with God again? Um, how, does that, how does that make sense of the new covenant? 
that is a great resource that you should avail yourself of and even bring to somebody else maybe that needs it as well. There's also books over there on the table as well. Peter has resources as well over here on the table. And if you're online, you can find those on Amazon as well, can't you, Peter? Okay. So check those out. Those will be great blessings to your life. And uh, next week, we're going to have Gwen Myrie. She's going to begin talking on the resurrection found in Jesus Christ and how we walk in that, which will be amazing. So don't miss that. Guys, be blessed. Have a fantastic week and enjoy your Sunday. We'll see you next week.